Good morning or good afternoon or good evening to all, depending on where you live. Uh, I want to, to express special uh, gratitude to Andrew, who stayed with us yesterday until 2 a.m. Uh, thank you for that and for being here in the morning. Um, Charles, maybe it's just a, a bit sad that I managed to stay that long, but I found it really interesting. <laughs> And thank you all for the, the great discussion we had uh, yesterday and that we're going to pursue right now. So we have three panels today. Um, uh, Pierre will introduce the first one uh, in, a, in a minute, um, which is about the, the dimensions or components of freedom of expression. Uh, we'll stop at noon, Paris time, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have a second panel uh, one hour later after the, the break lunch. Uh, from 1 to, to 3 p.m. And then after a half hour break, we'll have the final panel from uh, 3, 3.30 to 6 p.m. Uh, I can only say again how, how uh, uh, what a regret it is for us not to be able to, 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 to have you in Lyon and to, uh, to be able to uh, exchange uh, before and after the panels and to take you to some restaurant, but uh, this would happen at some point in the future, hopefully. Uh, it would have been a delight to, to meet you on a more personal level. Uh, so, Pierre? Sure. Thank you, Charles, and thank you everyone to be here for the second day and also the last one of our conference. Um, just several points before we start. Uh, please switch off your microphone when you are not speaking to avoid any interruption of our, of our speakers. Uh, this event has been recorded. If the speaker agree, we will post the video on our um, website. Um, like yesterday, each speaker will have between 15 and 20 minutes to summarize their chapters and comment. Of course, if they wish, they can respond to each other after all their presentation. And after that, we will open the discussion to the floor. So our third panel concerns the dimension of freedom of expression understood as a democratic right. It considers the content of this right from the point of view of speakers, audience members, and collective actors. What does freedom of expression imply for the citizen who takes the floors? What does it mean for the citizen who listen and want to have access to available opinion and information, but who may also wish to refuse to be exposed to them unwillingly? And to discuss these different points, we will hear from two authors in this section. The first one will be Marco Bassini, adjunct professor of constitutional law at Bocca University. Um, I precise that your chapter will be written with Oreste Policino, who may cannot be with us today. And the second, second presentation will be from Ellen Fenwick, professor of law at Durham University. Um, we just, I just received a mail from her saying that she will be coming very soon. So she will be here. Um, and your presentation will be discussed by Adrienne Stone, who is Raymond Barry Distinguished Professor and Director of the Center of Comparative Constitutional Studies at the University of Melbourne. So first, we, we will hear from Marco Bassini on his talk on the active profile of freedom of expression. Marco, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, I, first of all, want to thank you uh, for having me aboard in this uh, terrific project. And uh, I want to also share an apology for uh, not being able to send a, a paper, but just an outline with Professor Policino. Unfortunately, some health issues came up over the last weeks and we couldn't align the different parts of the paper, but we will share with you very soon. And uh, and uh, we definitely look forward to receiving comments and feedback and uh, uh, on this. We tried to work on this subject, uh, uh, taking uh, an original perspective, which tries to combine the different elements we see in uh, in this debate, and particularly to connect the active profile of freedom of expression with the uh, democratic uh, value of this of this right. Uh, we have chosen this perspective that is a perspective that looks just partially at the different communicative activities and the different expressive activities that we see in freedom of expression. And we decided to focus particularly on the right to hold opinion in order to focus on the formation of public opinion 
and then of course on the consequence of that uh, right uh, in terms of participation in the uh, debate in the public debate and also uh, uh, to focus on uh, how this uh, connection between democracy and uh, of course free speech is, is to be preserved in the context of a very evolving technological scenario leading to the reshaping of the public sphere. Uh, we raise a preliminary question in our paper that is uh, a question we tried to uh, make also in our uh, presentation one years ago that was is it a matter of wording and uh, why we, we we made this question we that is quite provoking i know because i think we have to understand uh, actually uh, that whether the protection granted to freedom of expression uh, depends on the wording of constitutional provisions and uh, provisions of human rights documents, and which is the contribution that courts provided in this respect in uh, making actually freedom of expression uh, living with a different significances uh, under different possible ages and uh, in different possible contexts. Because we want to stress the importance to look at the process of technical uh, technological evolution the change in the public sphere and to understand how there are new challenges, there are rising challenges. Uh, we see that the wording of constitutions has not prevented courts and particularly constitutional courts to elaborate on the coverage of freedom of expression. Uh, here we recall uh, the, the very important article by Professor Short on the difference between coverage and protection and uh, on the problems in terms of under-inclusiveness and over-inclusiveness, so we are well aware of the very important implications of wording. But we want to focus particularly on, on how courts went through this over time in different possible scenarios and how this uh, connection between democracy and freedom of expression was preserved uh, particularly from the perspective of the uh, speaker, so the active side that we consider here. Basically moving from the aftermath of the Second World War to the rise of cyberspace and its evolution. So we intend to capture the shift, how the shift in technology is reflected in the interpretation of freedom of expression as a guarantee for democracy, moving of course from a structural understanding of this right that is not only limited to uh, the individual perspective of the speaker, but is definitely focusing on the contribution to the actual debate that individuals are expected to provide. We try to focus in our paper on two case studies. Uh, one is relating to the public service broadcasting and freedom of broadcasting. And the reason why we focus on this is to show the ability of some constitutional courts, namely the Italian and the German one, to interpret the relevant constitutional provisions on freedom of expression broadly, requiring what Professor Keenan said, defined as a sustained plural public speech, requiring conditions to ensure the connection between speech and democracy, requiring diversity, requiring a plurality of viewpoint. The second case study uh, deals instead with a different problem, that is the problem of disinformation, that is of course a very a uh, hot topic now that we see uh, the rise of new digital powers. And uh, in this respect, we want to consider how constitutions and, and human rights documents apply to the dissemination of false information, particularly moving from the democratic commitment that we can see behind freedom of expression. So uh, we try to look at two different problems, two different case studies to understand actually how they contributed to preserving the link between democracy and, uh, and the freedom of expression. Uh, of course, the active profile sometimes is combined with the passive profile. We understand that there are, of course, possible interferences between the right to receive information, the right to uh, be informed, uh, and, uh, and the right to actively participate. But our focus wants to be on the conditions for individuals to participate uh, in a responsive way and to democracy and to exercise the right uh, to, uh, to participate in the democracy based on, uh, uh, on uh, uh, you know, the comprehensive and uh, pluralistic uh, provision of points of view. Uh, the first focus on the, uh, the first focus is as I said, on the public service broadcasting. Here, 
we can notice the important contribution from the Italian Constitutional Court and the General Federal Constitutional Tribunal, building a comprehensive framework of principles applicable to freedom of expression and having an important impact also in this respect on the active profile of, of freedom of expression. I think that the principle of media pluralism is definitely connected to the passive profile of freedom of expression. As I said before, it's related to the information that a potential speaker receives and maybe has a right to receive. But I think that there are also important connections with the individual right to hold opinions and the function of the right to hold opinions in the context of a democratic society. In both the experiences, in both the Italian and German uh, case, uh, the constitutional provision uh, doesn't do not say much about pluralism. They, they uh, do not mention actually pluralism and uh, uh, diversity of media and uh, you know they barely mention freedom of broadcasting. In the German constitution there is a reference in the first paragraph and the Italian constitution is mostly focused on freedom of press that is basically probably a choice made by the framers of the constitution at the time because this was definitely the most important media. Uh, moving from this uh, moving from this scenario, uh, we want to understand uh, what courts uh, have done in order to preserve a value and to safeguard a value that is very uh, pivotal in the context of a democratic society, that is the concept of media pluralism, and how they uh, try to contribute in framing the role of the public service broadcasting and its justification over time in the respective legal orders. It is not disputed that freedom of broadcasting per se could be a merely private and economic activity that falls within the constitutional provisions of freedom to conduct business. So one may say that this is not connected to freedom of expression. However, we know that uh, constitutional courts have attached a very important mandate, a functional mandate in their wording, to the public service media, and this shows how states can positively contribute to shape the public sphere and the public formation of opinion with a view to safeguarding the democratic nature of the legal order. Uh, the constitutional uh, tribunal in, in Germany, for instance, referred to freedom of broadcasting as a serving freedom in this respect. So we see also the important connection with the active side of freedom of expression. Uh, we try to compare uh, this uh, to uh, countries and how the constitutional case law uh, tried to make the point. In Italy, for example, there was a problem uh, of scarcity of resources that was a very common problem in the Second World War aftermath. And uh, the, the, the constitutional court largely relied on this scarcity argument to claim that opening the market would have resulted in an illegal poly. Uh, that was supposed to be dangerous for freedom of expression. There was a problem of scarcity of frequencies, and the reasoning of the Constitutional Court for preserving a monopoly in that sector was that, uh, of course, uh, the existence of a few private companies, a few private uh, uh, commercial broadcasters will have caused, uh, of course, uh, negative consequences for pluralism. You know, uh, we, we put uh, the power basically to shape the formation of public opinion in the hands of a few private company. And this was something that the court uh, wanted to avoid. And that's the reason why the court justified the existence of the public service broadcasting from the 1960s in the first judgment. We have in both, uh, in both the case law of the court here in Italy and the Germany, a long series of judgment justifying uh, the, the role of public service media, and and the, the, the Italian Constitutional Court actually had to uh, elaborate on the concept of pluralism in this respect, um, making, of course, clear that the pluralism is a truthful principle, and it, having an internal dimension and an external dimension, uh, internal pluralism is meant as, an, as, as a duty for the state to make sure that every broadcaster features the broadest possible spectrum of political, social, and cultural opinions. External pluralism instead requires the presence of a plurality of information sources. So 
uh, it implies a more direct connection also to the market, to the existence of uh, many players. But I want to stress that for a while, the Constitutional Court had actually to uh, rely on a technical argument. And uh, uh, that's why for a, quite a long time we had this uh, public service broadcasting working as a monopoly with a very specific permit. Uh, in Germany, we know that uh, the Federal Constitutional Tribunal referred to freedom of broadcasting as one of the warranty implied by freedom of expression, referring to free, comprehensive and truthfully presented information that must be immune from the interference from government and private powers. So the ultimate goal is to secure diversity of opinion. Diversity is, of course, very, uh, very connected to pluralism. And uh, we can say that, interestingly, the court said that the implementation of the public service broadcasting in, uh, in Germany was not an obvious choice. Uh, there was just a positive obligation for the lawmaker to implement a legal framework safeguarding freedom of broadcasting and its nature as serving freedom for, uh, for public formation of, of, of opinion. So we still see this connection with the idea that the active profile is, is definitely a concern, is definitely uh, an important reference for, for the court, for courts and in that case law. Uh, we see, of course, the goal of a free individual and public formation of opinion, and we definitely uh, can recall what when the, the, the Luf landmark case, when the court actually quoted uh, Justice Cardozo's opinion, recalling the importance of freedom of expression as the matrix and dispensable condition of nearly every other form of freedom. So the emergence of dual broadcasting model in Germany was definitely influenced. The private and uh, commercial broadcasting was not forbidden, uh, but uh, the Constitutional Court just seems to say to, to require that actually we safeguard freedom of broadcasting in its function as serving fun serving freedom. And this way we preserve uh, diversity and pluralism in the context of media. This is, of course, something uh, that is covered by freedom to conduct visit, but is also uh, essential for preserving the democratic nature of freedom of expression. At the moment, individuals form their opinions and participate in the uh, debate, in the public debate. We wanted then to focus on a second case study that is relating to this information. And we decided to focus on this uh, case study because we see, of course, very important changes in the public sphere. Uh, we see the rise of social networks. We see rising claims to make them subject to uh, public service obligations or to compare or equalize them to essential facilities. We have very interesting case law in the US. Uh, we know very well the opinion uh, by uh, Justice Thomas in uh, in uh, in the case concerning the, uh, the Donald Trump, but we we know that this is a very hot topic. Uh, we don't want to address here the point of social media regulation that is out of the scope of our our paper, but we still we see a very strong connection between the framing of the legal status and the consequence that activities such as content moderation and content policing may have when it comes to, uh, of course, uh, tackling this information. This was a point that already Justice Alito made very clear in his opinion in, in the Packingham case. So after having understood how courts tended to shape the role of the public service broadcasting to make sure that there was still that link between free speech and, and particularly the formation of public opinion and democracy, we want to address Another important uh, and, and uh, or more recent scenario that is the fight to disinformation. Because, of course, on one hand, we can say that the reason why we try to combat disinformation is to preserve democracy, because disinformation can have a very important impact. But at the same time, the idea that more and more the power to uh, take content policing and uh, uh, content moderation is up to private platforms seems to be, of course, itself a new challenge to democracy. And we know that constitution do not provide very helpful guidelines in this respect. We, we, we can look, have a look at the court of the uh, European Court of Human Rights and its case law. And uh, I think that we have to understand 
which is the extent to which certain measures uh, affecting the right of the speaker uh, and so the active side of freedom of expression can be implemented without being detrimental to democracy, to the expectation to participate in the public debate. So we want to avoid a scenario where actually the exercise of the right to speak is made conditional upon compliance with private companies' terms of services. But if you want this in a way, a similar problem to the problem that uh, you know, we had uh, many years ago the risk that we have only private operators influencing the process, not only of formation of public opinion, but also the process of dissemination of, of this opinion. If we look at the uh, European Court of Human Rights case law, we realize that the approach of the court has been quite strict on this. We know that there are just uh, rare judgments on the specific matter of disinformation. And we know that at the same time, uh, the court seems to be quite committed uh, from handy side on to protect uh, uh, broadly uh, freedom of expression, so the freedom of individuals to speak. Uh, in particular, looking at the case law, we can notice that it's very unlikely that, we, uh, that the court uh, approves a possible restriction on, on the freedom to speak uh, without a specific harm to individual or collective interests. And that is why uh, basically the, the, the second paragraph of Article 10 expressly requires the pursuit of a legitimate aim. So we, we should wonder actually uh, if, if there is actually a legitimate goal behind the implementation of possible restriction on the right to disseminate. And we know the, uh, that the court in, in the famous case, Salo versus Ukraine, made it clear the risk of a reasonable restriction on freedom of expression, deriving on prohibitions on discussion and dissemination of information that was merely suspected not to be truthful, so something that is just at risk and not necessarily false. So falsity alone is very unlikely uh, to, be, uh, to be limited, and it's very unlikely that the European Court of Human Rights can uh, consider compatible with Article 10 uh, similar measures. Uh, we know that there might be, of course, a way for combining the protection of democracy in terms of electoral processes and electoral competition and protection of freedom of expression. Uh, also, in this respect, we know that some states, France and Poland, have implemented some measures which are specific to the context of electoral processes uh, with some uh, summary procedures by which courts can intervene. In that case, uh, commentators have highlighted that there is an, a, a specific interest that the process of the, the safeguard of the fairness of election it may justify the combining uh, actually Article 3 of uh, the uh, Protocol 1 to the European Convention of Human Rights, so the right to free election, uh, a possible restriction on Article 10. But if we look at the approach of constitutional court, we, we realize that there is quite a consistent approach. In Germany, uh, we know that the German uh, uh, tribunal said that Article 5 protects value judgment uh, meant to convince others and to exert an intellectual influence, uh, regardless of uh, whether they are valuable, worthless, correct or false, uh, or justified emotionally or rationally. Uh, they, they focus on the contribution to the intellectual battle of opinions on issues of public concern. And we also know that the court in Germany made it clear that the communication of a fact is protected by freedom of opinion to the extent it is the basis for an opinion. So uh, the assertion of facts is no longer protected when it does not constitute of course, the basis for an opinion. But we have a point here, that a point that was uh, also explored in uh, Italy uh, many decades ago by uh, scholars on, on freedom of expression, I mentioned in Carlo Esposito, uh, concerning Article 21. Once we ascertain that the assertion of facts is not per se, uh, or falsity is not per se uh, protected by the Constitution, we should ask if this means that the state has an obligation, has a positive obligation to uh, punish, to prevent the dissemination of, of uh, this false statement. So that's actually a point that is still open for discussion that we, we have seen that the answers in France and Poland uh, seem to be 
uh, compatible with the idea that we have an interest in the protection and the safeguarding the fairness of the electoral proceedings. And so we tried to make this two case study and to compare basically these two uh, possible scenarios looking at various countries in Europe to understand actually uh, which are now the challenges for democracy and for, uh, for the aspect of freedom of expression relating to how individuals can participate in the public debate. We, we basically moved from the very beginning and, uh, and, uh, and looked at the role of public service broadcasting uh, in the context of the need to guarantee pluralism for uh, the formation of opinion and for making possible for them to participate in a democratic society. So we, uh, and, and I'm just concluding with this, uh, we wanted to focus on the role of courts in, in, in front of the reshaping of the public sphere. And the reshaping of the public sphere, in our view, is bringing important challenges for this link between democracy and freedom of expression, also from the perspective, of course, of the speaker. Uh, we know that in, in the absence of crystal clear choices in constitutions and human rights documents, this will probably leave more the floor to courts and actually the case studies we uh, try to outline seem to, seem to confirm that it's up to them, up to their case law, to preserve this inherent democratic function in the perspective of the speaker. Maybe the problems we have seen in this case studies are, the, are, are basically very similar, if not identical. The problem of concentration of power in the hands of a few private companies, a problem they wanted to avoid in the context of uh, broadcasting because at the beginning just a few operators could jump into that market and of course they could influence the formation of public opinion. Uh, now we have a similar problem when it comes to contrast to this information but uh, of course we should consider the difference between broadcasters having an editorial responsibility and an editorial control and private platforms that are supposed not to have such kind of editorial control. And that's why, even if we do not specifically step in this issue of the regulation of social media, we feel that it's important to consider how democracy must be preserved also in light of this important reframing. There are very interesting uh, debates concerning whether they are state actors or public fora and uh, uh, we, we believe that the problem cannot probably be resolved only looking at the horizontal indirect effect of freedom of expression. That is one of the structural uh, components of this freedom that, of course, can uh, can uh, come into play also in this respect. So, basically, that's our uh, first sketching out of questions. We know that I, I try to raise more questions than providing answers, but. Um, our, our actual uh, interest now is to understand what states and what courts can do to make sure that this link can be uh, preserved over time and also in, in the reshaping of the public sphere. So thank you for your attention and I look forward to, to receive comments and feedback. Thanks. Thank you, Marco, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to, 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 to discuss with you, with you all about all these points. Um, without any transition, I would like to pass the floor to Ellen Penwick. As I mentioned, you are professor of law at Durham University. And your presentation is called A Critic of Audience Right to Receive Information on IDs under Democratic Interpretation of Freedom of Expression, the stance taken at the Strasbourg Court under the Human Rights Act. The floor is yours, Ellen. Thank you, and good morning to everybody. I hope everyone can hear me okay. So yes. this this paper will pick up on some of the themes that we've just heard about. Um, it concerns um, the, it, it, it intends to consider the ways that a democratic interpretation of freedom of expression understood as including the right to receive information and ideas can be found to lead in certain instances to curbing political expression in the interests of furthering democracy. By political expression, I mean expression that informs the audience and it enables debate on political matters broadly conceived, including matters of general public interest, enabling the audience to make informed decisions on such matters of a special significance at election, at election times. On that basis, at Strasbourg, expression tends to be valued instrumentally for the benefits it brings to democratic participation. 
So the importance of political expression means that challenges at Strasbourg to laws directly interfering with the right of the audience to receive information and ideas will probably succeed where such expression is at stake, unless such interference is claimed in itself to enhance participation in the democratic process or as necessary generally to protect a democratic society. So some restrictions on political expression have been accepted at Strasbourg as aimed at securing the more effective participation of the audience in the democratic process. But as I argue, such restrictions may be enabled at Strasbourg to encroach disproportionately on receipt of political expression or information, and therefore may not always achieve the end in question. So I'll begin by just briefly noting the emphasis placed on the importance of political expression by the court in a range of cases. The courts repeatedly asserted that freedom of expression constitutes one of the foundations of a democratic society due partly to its imp importance in enabling uh, audience participation in the democratic process. It's found that due to its importance, there's little scope under Article 10, Paragraph 2 for restrictions on political speech or on debate on questions of public interest. So the margin of appreciation may narrow almost or entirely to vanishing point. Particular stress, as, as we all know, has also been laid, as in Castells in Spain, upon the preeminent role of the press, which, in its vital role of public watchdog, has a duty to impart information and ideas on matters of public interest that the audience has a right to receive. It may also be noted that in the recent case of Revenchenko and Russia, the court found that political expression emanating from a blogger, not a traditional journalist, would also receive a high level of protection given, given the audience rights to have access to such expression. It said that the issues raised in the relevant video were undeniably part of a political debate on a matter of general and public concern, relations between Russia and Ukraine and the impact of Russia's foreign policy. So the basic thesis behind this stance clearly is that citizens can't participate fully in a democracy unless they have a reasonable understanding of political issues Therefore, open debate on such matters and protection for the media is necessary to ensure the proper workings of a democracy. Importantly, the term democracy or the furtherance of democracy hasn't been narrowly defined at Strasbourg to include only according value to allowing criticisms of the decisions of the particular government in power or politicians in general. For example, in Sunday Times in the UK, the case concerned an interference with an article discussing a particular case which concerned the marketing of the drug thalidomide to pregnant women on the basis that it interfered with the authority of the judiciary. Given the public interest value of the article, a narrow margin of appreciation only was granted. Partly on that basis, the tests of necessity and proportionality were not found to be satisfied, so hence a breach of Article 10 was found. So I've indicated then that the general position at Strasbourg as regards the importance of expression as allowing the audience to participate in the democratic process. But the court has, however, also recognised that state interference with political expression may be necessary to promote democracy, including via ensuring that the audience is exposed to a plurality of views. The court has shown acceptance of the need to ensure such plurality in order to protect and promote democracy supporting expression. In Manuel and others and Moldova, the court found that domestically, there were insufficient statutory guarantees of the independence of the public broadcaster. The domestic framework in that respect was inadequate. A breach of Article 10 was therefore found. This issue, of course, arose centrally in the Grand Chamber in relation to broadcasting in Central Europa and Italy, on the basis that Italy was failing to ensure media plurality. The Grand Chamber found a breach of Article 10 and said concerning plura plura pluralism in the audiovisual media, as it's often noted, there can be no democracy without pluralism. It said it's of the essence of democracy to allow diverse political programmes to be proposed and debated. It found that a situation whereby a powerful group in society is permitted to obtain a position of dominance over the audiovisual media, tending to curb broadcasters' editorial freedom, undermines the fundamental role <clears throat> of freedom of expression in a democratic society, as enshrined in Article 10, in particular where it serves to impart inf <clears throat> information and ideas of general interest. So I found that the court is prepared to accept restrictions on expression designed in themselves 
to further the quality of audience participation in the democratic process. The connection between acceptance of interference designed to ensure plurality <clears throat> in order to protect expression to support such participation is relatively uncontroversial. But I'm about to turn to Strasbourg jurisprudence on bans on political advertising. Such bans can be justified on similar grounds, but they have, I'd argue, a more problematic connection with providing such support. So despite what I've said as to audience rights recognised at Strasbourg to receive information, such rights have at times been denied at Strasbourg based on the need to ensure the non-dominance of campaigning groups within the democratic process. A ban on political advertising in broadcasting was, however, rejected in VGT in Switzerland. The case concerned such a ban in relation to animal welfare, but it was found to fail to satisfy the demands of proportionality under Article 10. The court said that a prohibition of political advertising, advertising which applies only to certain media, not others, doesn't appear to be of a particularly pressing nature and therefore found a breach of Article 10. The same might have been expected to have been found in Animal Defenders in the UK, which was eventually considered by the Grand Chamber. An animal rights group had its advertising rejected in broadcasting due to the ban on political advertising in broadcasting in the UK. The applicant's main argument was that the prohibition on paid political advertising was too wide to be proportionate, partly because it was too widely defined. The applicant accepted the necessity of the prohibition during pre-election periods, but it considered disproportionate its maintenance outside those periods for social advocacy groups on matters of public interest. In particular, it argued that the different approach to the broadcast and other media was unproven, inexplicable and unnecessary. The Grand Chamber said that freedom of the news media afforded the public one of the best means of discovering and forming an opinion of the ideas and attitudes of political leaders. So the public would have a right to receive such ideas, citing Centro, Centro Europa. The core issue, the court said, was whether in adopting the general measure and striking the balance it did, the legislature had acted within the margin of appreciation afforded to it. The justification offered by the government included the need to protect the electoral process as part of the democratic order. The court noted that both parties had the same objective, namely the maintenance of a free and pluralist debate on matters of public interest and more generally contributing to the democratic process. The court said it was required, therefore, to balance, on the one hand, the applicant's right to impart information and ideas of general interest, which the public was entitled to receive, with, on the other, the authority's desire to protect the democratic debate and process from distortion by powerful financial groups with advantageous access to influential media. The issue to be resolved, then, was whether the <laughs> prohibition had gone too far. The consideration of the ban was, the court emphasised, the culmination of an exceptional examination by parliamentary and judicial groups um, in the UK. The court also placed emphasis, emphasis on the circumscribed nature of the prohibition, in particular applying only to paid political advertising. The court found that there's a wealth of historical, cultural and political differences within Europe, so it would be for each state to mould its own democratic vision. It reiterated that due to their direct and continuous contact with the vital forces of their states, the legislative and judicial authorities were best placed to assess the particular difficulties in safe safeguarding the democratic order of the state. It re-emphasized the lack of consensus on how to regulate paid political advertising in broadcasting and reiterated that a lack of a relevant consensus among contracting states could speak in favor of allowing a somewhat wider margin of appreciation than that normally afforded to restrictions on expression on matters of public interest. On that basis, proportionality demands were found to be satisfied. So it can be seen then that audience rights to receive information relevant to the democratic process can be circumscribed at Strasbourg due to the competing demand to ensure that a plurality of views are heard also serving that process. Thus, the court has accepted an instrumentalist approach to political expression. If the aim of ensuring the effective democratic participation of the audience would not be furthered by the expression in question, even if it could be deemed political, then interference with it can be accepted under Article 10. 
But the applicants point that a distinction could be drawn between small campaigning groups campaigning on a single issue and party political advertising didn't gain much uh, purchase in the decision due to the margin conceded to the state affected by consensus analysis. I now want to turn to certain fairly similar considerations in relation to so-called disinformation. Recent examples of the use of disinformation, especially to undermine democracy, abound as I've set out in the chapter. In the chapter, very recent examples are given linked to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which I won't reiterate here uh, due to time. The Strasbourg Court has confronted so far only a small number of instances in which statements of possible public interest value or a value in relation to the democratic process may be untrue. And in such instances has tended to concede quite a wide margin of appreciation to the state, depending on the subject matter. Delphi and Estonia concerned speech of potential public interest on Delphi's internet news portal, which, however, was interspersed with clearly defamatory comments. The Grand Chamber found that Delphi's rights under Article 10 had been interfered with since it had been found liable in respect of the comments posted there on the portal by third parties. In concluding that the interference was justified, the Grand Chamber took into account that as a professionally managed and commercially driven company, Delphi had sought to attract comments and had a moderation system in place. Given that Delphi could have anticipated the comments and put in place a more effective filter, the interference in question was found to be proportionate to the aim pursued. But the decision placed more onerous duties and responsibilities on such portals than on social media platforms, meaning that audience participation in online debates would be more limited in relation to such portals, which appear to include online commenting forums run by the press. The decision appeared to increase the likelihood that portals might disallow comments altogether, thereby curbing audience rights to debate with each other and have access to various opinions. That decision can be compared with Brzezinski and Poland, in which the court considered sanctions placed on misinformation during an election campaign, thus political expression of particular uh, significance as regards the democratic process was directly at stake. In a finding distinguishing this instance from that in Delphi, the court found that the case concerned a matter of undoubted public interest, local government management. The court said that it was incumbent on the domestic court to focus on whether the applicant politician had acted with the requisite diligence and on whether the impugned expression had a credible factual basis. It decided that that had not occurred and therefore found a breach of Article 10. So while the court has traditionally supported audience rights to receive information, especially since to, so doing aids in ensuring that democracy can thrive, it may accept interference with expression that falls into the category of disinformation as inimical to democracy since it can distort the democratic process. But it's important that the court ensures that only interferences with clearly false information are accepted. Similarly, democracy-based justifications can be found in relation to curbing extreme speech. So-called extremist expression, such as racist speech, is usually related to ideas that may be termed political and could potentially make a contribution to democratic debate. But challenges to bans on extreme expression may fail under Article 10 or may not be considered under the article after being declared inadmissible due to the provision of Article 17. In this context of extreme political expression, the court has tended to see speech as a public interest and as justified instrumentally by reference to its beneficial effect on democracy due to its effect on the audience, rather than seeing it as an individual right of inherent value. If the value of free speech is seen mainly in terms of its contribution to the political process, then the argument may prevail that allowing the speech in question would do more harm than good to the maintenance of democracy in terms of the impact on the audience, given that some extremist expression, whether from far right secular speakers or speaks in sp speakers inspired by ISIS or similar groups, has countered democratic aims, as found in the case of Brind at Strasbourg, and as also found in a range of other cases I've set out in the chapter concerning extremist expression, often under Article 17. The court's stance under Article 17 is, I suggest, open to criticism as failing to confine itself clearly to expressions of support for violence. 
a full application of the test under Article 10, Paragraph 2 to interference with extremist expression, confining reliance on Article 17 more clearly, clearly to expressions of violent extremism, would avoid setting aside substantial principles and safeguards characteristic of the European speech protective framework. It might be expected that the court's stance as to a right of access to information from an unwilling speaker would provide a contrast to its stance as to extremist expression and disinformation. But it's also been quite cautious in this area in which audience rights alone may be at stake, not only those of the speaker, not also necessarily those of the speaker, even in relation to political expression. The leading decision is Magyar Helsinki and Hungary, which concerned the disclosure of public defenders' names. The court concluded that it didn't consider that it's prevented from um, interpreting Article 10 as including a right of access to information. But four constraints were found to apply to enable the right to be exercised. The purpose of the information would be relevant. It would have to be necessary for the exercise of freedom of expression. The information would need to meet a public interest test. The role of the applicant would be relevant. Journalists or researchers would be in a privileged position. The information requested, the court said, should be ready and available, rather uncertain test. In that instance, against Hungary, applying the principles, failure to provide access to the information was found to lead to a breach of Article 10, since no countervailing interest was found to arise. In contrast, when the principles were applied in SEX and Croatia 2022, no breach was found, although the information was of political um, import. The applicant requested access to the classified presidential records as part of research for a book he was writing on the founding of the Republic of Croatia, but was denied access to some records. He relied on Article 10. The court relied on the findings in Magyar Helsinki and found that all the four tests were satisfied, so there'd been an interference with the applicant's Article 10 rights. The court referred to animal defenders and Delphi, in finding that as a starting point, a pressing social need must be shown for the interference. But the court said that national security, being an evolving and context-dependent concept, the states must be afforded a wide margin of appreciation in assessing what poses a national security risk at a particular time in this context. The court decided that the Croatian authorities didn't violate the applicant's right to freedom of expression by denying him access to a range of documents from the presidential archive related to recent Croatian history. It can be concluded that this judgment has some parallels with certain of the cases on extremist expression in the sense that if national security is threatened, meaning that the democratic society itself is under threat, then that concern ultimately to protect the society can override the interest in serving democracy by allowing access to the information. So in conclusion then, I've discussed a range of restrictions on audience rights to receive information and ideas deployed to seek to ensure their quality in terms of supporting democracy and in some instances, at least purportedly, to safeguard the democracy itself in terms of national security. The restrictions on political expression accepted at Strasbourg that I've discussed are aimed, at least ostensibly, at securing the more effective participation of the audience in the democratic process by excluding anti-democratic expression, including disinformation undermining that process, political advertising distorting it, and those intended to ensure audience receipt of a plurality, plurality of views on political issues. But are the restrictions accepted, including on a right of access to information, fully in accordance with ensuring audience democratic participation? It can be found that the speech rationale based on participation in the democratic process would provide little support for extreme speech in certain forums, advocating anti-democratic positions or for allowing media monopolies. However, bans on political advertising or on spreading misinformation about politicians or on providing access to information run the risk of failing to satisfy the demands of proportionality while apparently seeking to serve the enhancing of the quality of the democratic process. That's partly because consensus analysis linked to the margin of appreciation has influenced the court's thinking on these matters as seen in animal defenders. Where it's had such influence, the proportionality analysis has not been strict. If consensus analysis had not played a part in animal defenders, the margin conceded would have been narrower and therefore, although the matter had been debated extensively within the UK, the court would more readily have reached its own conclusion on proportionality, taking a stricter stance. 
Consensus analysis doesn't appear to have played such an important part in the Article 17 cases, but the margin of appreciation conceded to the state when determining that the article would apply appears to be fairly wide. If it was narrowed, greater methodological consistency to the policing of the divide between Article 17 and 10 could be achieved, placing a much closer focus on the necessity and proportionality of restrictions on extreme expression, and thereby placing a greater emphasis on audience rights to receive it. So as I've explored in the context discussed, while the rhetoric of protecting audience rights to receive information remains strong, Strasbourg acceptance of some of the restrictions, including as to access to information from an unwilling speaker, may fail ultimately to achieve that end, which is protecting and furthering audience participation in democracy in question. Thank you for listening. I'm looking forward to receiving comments. Thank you very much, Lynn. Um, and thank you for your very complete presentation. Um, Adrienne, if you want to make some comments, I think it's time for you. Terrific. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. All right. Thank you very much um, for the invitation to read and comment on these papers. It's a real pleasure to be here, even this virtually, and to see colleagues and friends um, as well as new acquaintances. And I'm actually particularly delighted to see a couple of people whose work I've edited in the Oxford Handbook of Freedom of Expression, but I've never actually had the opportunity to meet before. So um, uh, it's nice to virtually meet you. Um, and um, I enjoyed very much these papers, I want to say. I don't think I've yet fully plumbed these de their depths. Um, and so I look forward as they develop to reading more and thinking more about them. And I do come as to this project somewhat as an outsider. So let me s state what I understand to be the purpose of this section of the book. Um, I take it to be assumption or, or a premise of the volume that it does have and should have. Dimension that is on the listener as well as the people and dimensions that focus on the collective as well as the individual. Now, I think if that is the premise, I think the book, the um, papers succeed in um, demonstrating well these dimensions of freedom of expression, although they do it in very different ways. So Helen Fenwick's paper is a, is a deep and detailed analysis to the way in which the European Court of Human Rights is attentive to the listener's perspective across four areas, media plurality, ban on political ads, uh, disinformation and extreme speech. And it largely makes, I think, a very compelling case uh, that there are circumstances in which limitations on freedom of expression ought to be understood as promoting the real exercise of those things to which freedom of expression is ultimately aimed, okay? Uh, giving the listener the kind of what uh, Andrew, my colleague Andrew Kenyon will call plural public speech that they need to be effective participants in a truly effective and healthy democratic uh, process. Um, Marco Bassini and Oreste Polancini's paper through its through two case studies, I take it to be making uh, and what I think is an even bolder argument for attention to the conditions for the exercise of meaningful rights of participation uh, by arguing that we need uh, uh, to consider you know, in a very full sense the way in which freedom of expression operates and that it may well go beyond its traditional operation to impose, for example, direct horizontal obligations on other parties. All right. So I have, I hope I've understood that. Now, if my understanding of the, of the aim of this section and of what these papers are doing in relation to it is correct, I have the following four comments and please correct me if I'm wrong. The first one is that I think um, it, I'd like to uh, introduce another uh, dimension of freedom of expression. Um, in the effective dimension and to the speaker and listen dimension, I think that we need to think about what I call in some of my work, the permissive and the prescriptive dimension. And I think uh, Helen's and Marco's papers, if I may use your first names, uh, actually do this very well. Helen's paper is largely directed towards uh, what I would call the permissive dimension of freedom of freedom of expression. That is what of a right of freedom of expression must permit in order to ensure 
that we have meaningful rights of participation. Whereas Marco's paper, Marco and Arista's paper is more fully um, devoted to the prescriptive dimension of the constitution. That is what it requires of others. Okay, now this brings me to my second comment. Um, I think it would be interesting, at least for me, to see these papers consider the relationship of the dimensions they identify to the broader uh, global context. Uh, I think that um, uh, if you did so, you would see that the permissive dimension of freedom of expression that Helen's paper beautifully shows in relation to the European Court of Human Rights is very widely shared, for example, across the common law world. Um, but you and um, and I think there would be a lot of intellectual cousins there. Um, the intellectual cousins uh, worldwide for um, uh, Marco's paper, I think, and this is a suggestion you might find in the transformative constitutional traditions of the global south, right? That are really in quite ambitious ways aimed at. Um, uh, that I understand the constitutional project to be really the transformation of society in order to achieve a particular constitutional vision, right? Varies a little bit whether you're India or South Africa or other places, but um, that seems to me to be, um, uh, and now I, I think that that might give you a firmer grounding in uh, the global uh, context. Um, and thirdly, I think it might lead you to see that um, I think much of what particular Marco's paper is suggesting is bringing freedom of expression, something close to something like a social and economic right. And that the social and economic rights literature would give you a lot of intellectual tools to try and figure out how it is that you really shape a right that is going to have this somewhat transformative aim. Okay, that's my second comment, more attention to the global context. The third comment um, is that, um, if you are looking at the prescriptive, the, what I call the prescriptive and permissive elements or, or dimension of freedom of expression, you are really looking at the structural nature of freedom of speech. So you're not thinking so much about what, whose right is it, right? So is it an individual's, is it a, is a collective's, is it the listener's, it's the speaker? You're actually thinking about what kind of right is it? What is it there to do? What does it entitle you to? And once you take that, I think if I may just comment, particularly on Marco's paper, the text of the constitution is going to be very little to do with the content of freedom of expression along those dimensions. In fact, the content of freedom of expression is really going to be driven what I've called in my work, a deep background commitment constitutional order. And a constitution is primary because by structuring government and then limiting power, is going to approach that very differently than a constitution that conceives its constitutional project as something much more ambitious. So I think if you add in the structural dimension of permissiveness and prescriptiveness, um, then I think you will um, end up um, looking uh, well beyond the text to these deep background commitments. I actually think freedom of expression is very often a very, very vivid illustration of the differences in these diff deep background commitments. And I have a... Um, a piece which is forthcoming in an edited volume from Sujit Chowdhury and Michaela, um, um, I'm sorry, it's just um, uh, slipped my mind, but I'm sure you all know who I mean, uh, that I, I can provide to you. At, at, the brother? Um, uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, Michaela is um, actually even been my co-teacher in my free speech course. It's terrible for me to just remember, misremember Michaela's name at this moment. Okay, here he brings me to my last point. Um, and I fear that my colleague Andrew Kenyon will slump in his seat when he says this because he's heard me say it before. But I'm overall extremely um, uh, sympathetic to this desire for a much richer understanding of the dimensions of freedom of expression, in particular in the way in which these dimensions are realised in different ways in different systems throughout the world. But I do have a worry that as we make our idea of freedom of expression more and more and more capacious, it becomes so capacious that we might risk losing the analytical power of the idea. 
So there is a risk that freedom of expression simply comes to mean whatever it is, whatever conditions we need in order to have effective public participation is what freedom of expression requires, right? Um, now, I think um, another way to analyze, analyze it that is a little bit more analytically satisfying is that freedom of expression is one of the things that you might need to have the kind of sustained plural public speech or however you want to uh, talk about um, the conditions for exercise of um, participation rights. Uh, it's one of the things we need, but it's not all of the things that we need. And that some of what is sometimes packed into the concept of freedom of expression here would actually better be understood as analytically separate, but just equally required. Um, now, I understand there is strategic value in broadening your concept of freedom of expression to cover positive duties and all kinds of other things, attention to the, the conditions for the exercise of free speech rights. I understand the strategic value of doing so when you are relying upon a constitution that protects freedom of expression but doesn't um, protect some important um, other kind of um, uh, right or um, other conditions for the exercise of rights. Um, and you can see this, for example, really clearly in the United States. It's where all the protection for, for academic freedom gets shoved under the First Amendment because there is no constitutional protection for academic freedom, but then it really misshapes academic freedom. Now, I know many European constitutions um, protect academic freedom simply, but I think we're seeing some versions um, of the problem in other respects. Um, and so, and, and I should also say that this, um, uh, this desire to be attentive to the condition for exercise is not unique to freedom of speech. You know, it's the reason we have substantive and not formal conceptions of equality, for example. Um, and so um, uh, there, there are other parallels to be drawn here. Now, um, I think that um, the other risk of uh, this overcapacious um, conception of freedom of speech is it focuses us too much on judicial protection of freedom of speech and away from other institutions that have really, really important roles to play. And so um, fourth branch integrity institutions are really important for securing the conditions for meaningful political participation. So a really good elections commission, for example, proper scrutiny of the media, for example, properly functioning and properly funded universities, for example. Um, and I, I, I think it is worth paying attention to that directly rather than trying always to get to the conditions for meaningful public participation through the prisms of freedom of expression. So I very much appreciate this project. I hope to see it developed. Um, uh, in the ways that I've suggested and no doubt other ways I haven't thought of, but there might be a question to which I direct your attention, which is where is the stopping point? Where do we draw a boundary around freedom of expression and look to other analytical categories in order to ensure that uh, public participation in a democracy is truly meaningful? And that's all I have to say. Thanks very much. Thank you, Adrienne. Before I open the discussion to the floor, Marco, Hélène, do you want to answer or to follow to uh, Adrienne's comment? As you, as you wish. Um, I, I want, yes, I mean, I'm very receptive to what's been said. I think, it, you know, that, that's, you know, that's very interesting. And I think that can be, some of those points can be developed within the paper. Just on the last point that was made about other institutions that can protect democracy apart from just relying on freedom of expression, um, an, an example I actually took out of the paper because because of time, but one example is represented, I think, by um, the attempt to control the social media companies, which is going on at the moment in the UK in something called the online safety bill, and the idea being that the social media, um, the private companies that obviously own the social media platforms should be um, policed much more rigorously than they have been so that, for example, misinformation would be much less likely to be carried on their platforms, um, that thereby distorting democracy. Uh, and also placing various duties on them, one of them simply to protect freedom of expression. So in other words, directly interfering with the operation of power uh, uh, bodies that control a powerful medium 
um, and this is the most ambitious attempt, as far as I know, in the whole world to do this. Obviously, it's been done in other places developing uh, such me uh, measures, but not on such an ambitious uh, scale. Whether or not this this is um, successful, <laughs> well, remains to be seen, because, of course, this isn't this isn't law yet. But as I say, it's an attempt to make, make the social media companies um, part participate more effectively, at least in part, in in um, safeguarding the democratic process. So I think that's an example that, yeah, I would I would add into be happy to you know add into the paper or at least develop in the paper, um, and uh, alongside other such rather similar um, initiatives that are happening globally at the moment. So. Obviously, this is partly about protecting freedom of expression, but it's not just about it's about placing specific duties on um, the social media, uh, the companies owning the social media platforms in order directly to protect the dem democratic process, not necessarily just through something to do with protecting freedom of expression. Ma Marco, do you want to add something? Very, very briefly, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, Professor Stone for his very interesting comments and very helpful and definitely we will take them into account in the paper and in, in the more structured version we're going to uh, share. Um, I think we have a focus. Uh, I think it's it's very interesting to look at, so at, at our experiences in our jurisdictions. We will definitely try to, uh, we know we have a focus on Europe, but uh, the US is a very interesting example. We, we have tried not to look too much at because otherwise uh, it becomes a comparison. But I think the experiences you mentioned are very, very interesting. And uh, I'm, I'm, I will definitely have a look at them to uh, more elaborate more on the on the points that uh, can be definitely uh, deeper in the in the final version. In regard, as regards the role of other institutional actors, I absolutely uh, think it's important. So we we actually focus on courts, uh, maybe we, because we wanted to stick to the um, let's say to the, to the idea of look at how actually we have to see constitutions and context and uh, this idea of the reshaping of the public sphere led us to focus more on the judicial reaction that is generally the one we can, um, you know, uh, must immediately perceive and understand. But I, I, I definitely agree that we, we have to think a lot about all the other possible institutional actors. I'm thinking about the European Commission and the many initiatives on disinformation, but also uh, in the in the in various sectors. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely open to to that, and we can reframe a bit our our paper in their respect so thank you so much thank you boss so we have question from george jacob christophe and andrew i will follow this order so george go ahead thank you uh, thank you both for great papers i have a question for helen uh, helen terrific paper i really like, liked it i totally agree with your critique of consensus and the lack of consistency in the Strasbourg case law I think you're spot on on all the points you made. Um, my question is about the link between democracy and the idea of pluralism in Strasbourg. Uh, and it's, more, it's, it's a question about how you think these two concepts are, are linked, normatively speaking, because Strasbourg doesn't say much. And I wanted to draw a, a distinction between two different ways in which pluralism and democracy might, might be linked. One is that the idea of pluralism is an end in itself. We want a state of affairs where the channels of political communication display a pluralism of opinion. So it, it, we want a set of affairs where there's pluralism. The second idea is different, is concerned with pluralism when the, the, way by in, the way in which pluralism is interfered is problematic. So it's about the means in which pluralism is violated or taken away. And the two examples here is money. So when pluralism is under threat because of people spending money, and second way is through corruption, when the same people own the media and control information. So this second idea is not about creating an end state of affairs where there's a lot of, lots of political opinions, but it's about stopping impermissible ways in which pluralism can be undermined. So the second one is not about state of affairs. The second one is about ways in which people can spend money or corruption and undermine pluralism. So that second idea is, is less instrumentalist. Right, it's more about finding some ways of interfering with that being permissible. And I think these different conceptions of the link between pluralism and democracy would entail different restrictions. 
And I think that distinction I drew would have a different uh, approach to animal defenders. I think it would be way more favorable because exactly they, they weren't spending any big money, they weren't interfering impermissibly with the process and so on. So, so I think this different link between pluralism and democracy is, is crucially important to understand how the case law should develop. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that question. So shall I, do you want me to, shall I respond now and wait? Um, for... We maybe can take another question, Jacob. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Um, um, I also have a question just following um, um, Helen's paper and also following Adrian's comments as well. Really following what Adrian was saying about how um, the more we demand of Article 10, the more we demand of free speech, the less crisp its requirements can become. And I think uh, freedom of information is an example of that, because a, a right to freedom of information is very different from the traditional free speech issues. If you have a right to freedom of information, courts would have, and you put it under Article 10, you courts have to decide, you know, what information you're entitled to, on what basis it can be accept, exempt, what time limits, who's entitled, you know, there, there's all kinds of questions about managing the positive right there. And I just feel like once you build in all of those factors, is it always going to be heavily qualified and will end up being something of a disappointment? So I always feel like I have some sympathy for what the court in the domestic court in the UK said in Kennedy to say these the areas like freedom of information are probably best left to the legislature. I'm also tempted to come up with a defense of animal defenders. I should probably leave this one alone. I've written about it in the past. Um, it was a very blunt measure, um, but it was one that was had played a role in keeping money out of British politics and of various other European countries as well. So, you know, and I think the courts were deciding that firstly with a view of, you know, UK Strasbourg relations when they decide animal defenders as a political dimension to it, and also very much looking over to the US and seeing what's happening there with money and politics and seeking to avoid that. So while it is a very blunt measure, it did play some kind of role there as well. Okay, thanks. Okay, Ellen, maybe we can answer these two first question. And after that, I will give the floor to uh, Christophe and Andrew. Okay, so in terms of what George was saying, um, so, right, the question of well, exactly what type of um, interference the court is considering when it's looking at how to enforce media pluralism. Um, well, focusing, I think, on that, I think it's fair to say that the court hasn't gone into great depth in relation to exactly what is what the well what the aims are in terms of particular methods of enforcing pluralism in other words which i think was what seemed to lie behind what george said um the merely ensuring or seeking to ensure some form of pluralism wouldn't be enough in other words one would expect the court would make some attempt to look at the quality of the um, the quality of the, the response to measures to enforce media pluralism. In other words, what exactly is being done here? Are we seeking to just break a monopoly um, for, merely for the sake of it, simply in order to perhaps get if, you know, certain other platforms or, or newspapers or whatever we're talking about um, an ability to enter the market without any regard at all to the quality of the outputs that that of the provider in question, the media provider in question um, might uh, therefore be able to uh, provide to the public, to the audience. So I would say the court, of course, this is a difficult area for the court because we're talking about all sorts of different types of ways of managing media monopolies, including now very much social media, including even the use of algorithms, as, as we know, which, which can relate, can have a, a monopolistic type of effect in terms of the kind of information that audiences might receive. So we're asking quite a lot of the court and it may be the case that um, legislation, but of course, possibly at the EU level, although obviously that wouldn't necessarily affect the UK now unless we adopted it ourselves, which we might. But yes, I think we, it is probably asking quite a lot of the court in order when it's looking at so many different countries, so many different types of approaches to uh, media monopolies to go into depth as to exactly how far um, we are trying to seek to ensure quality of um, the information provided, information and ideas provided by a particular outlets. So I agree in principle that that is an issue that ought to be considered, not just merely the whole idea of pluralism without more. So I would I would certainly agree with that. Um, but I think there was some question about the type of interference in question. In other words, 
what method would be used to try to break a media monopoly. Um, and that, I think, is going to become a far more, a more pertinent question. Well, or rather, it's going to become even more prominent due to the whole issue of the social media platforms. Um, as we probably know, um, there are efforts at the moment to ensure that the, the uh, social media platforms can't take down news content or rather can't prevent access to the content of, of newspapers. And that's an issue that's likely to come before the European Court of Human Rights in due course. Um, and I think it's also, you know, it's, a, it's also a very difficult, in some ways, it's a fairly technical question. Say, for example, um, there's an attempt to prevent uh, social media platforms, A, having an impact, well, a sort of mon monolith, monolith, mon monopoly style impact, I think we'll do, monopoly style impact on um, what the social media platforms are doing in terms of their promulgation of um, well, political information in the form of news. So, in other words, their own interference, which is happening at the moment across the globe with uh, news outlets and also how to prevent monopolies within the social media field itself. And it's fairly obvious, of course, that, uh, you know, one one company ten that owns uh, Facebook and Instagram um, tends to dominate the uh, the news agenda and a number of other agendas, social agenda, social uh, social uh, interest agendas as well. So again, this I think is not a, it's not a situation that the European Court of Human Rights has grappled with yet, but I think challenges are bound to arise, and presumably it will seek to apply the kind of monopoly style um, jurisprudence it's already produced to the, that situation. But I think it will it will be it will struggle. Uh, Judge Iker was talking about this um, at my university the other day, and I think it's fair to say that it's it's very much in its infancy in terms of what how the European Court of Human Rights is likely to approach. Um, well, both the issues uh, that George raised on the point that um, uh, Jacob made. So, in terms of freedom of information, and perhaps it should be left to the legislatures in the different member states. And obviously, it's difficult for the European Court of Human Rights to deal with the whole access to information issue, which is extremely complex. And obviously, a number of the states will have freedom of information type of acts, access to information type of acts, with all sorts of exceptions, etc. However, I would say that in states that don't have anything we'd really recognise as a freedom of information act, Article 10 may be uh, perhaps the best chance that certain citizens have or certain uh, media bodies have uh, obtaining information in that state, which I think it may well be why it's it's not perhaps enough just to leave it to the legislature if the legislature is unwilling for fairly obvious reasons due to the political dimension, obviously, of freedom of information um, to pass legislation uh, that is that we really, as I say, recognise as a freedom of information measure that really has bite in terms of forcing um, public, public authorities, government bodies, etc., to release information they are unwilling to release on probably often on political grounds. So on that basis, I would say Article 10 may have a role um, in terms of some of the member states where such measures are not in place, or at least not ones we'd recognise as really a freedom of information measure. Um, so, yes, I think it's a difficult role for the European Court of Human Rights, but on the other hand, I think it may have to play it in relation to certain member states. On the other point about uh, the case of Kennedy and, and animal defenders, I think all I would say is, yes, I understand why they reached the decision that they did in uh, in Kennedy, but no, yeah, sorry, that was a freedom of information point, not, not, not related animal defenders. I understand that, but obviously that was the case in the UK where we have a freedom of information act. Um, in relation to animal defenders, um, I would say that the court, yes, of course, the court was looking at a pretty broad, well, a broad measure, obviously, but the court could have, as I said, made more attempt to to look at the issue of proportionality in relation to, as, as obviously I mentioned, small campaigning groups like animal defenders campaigning on a single issue. Yes, of course, as, as Jacob said, it keeps in a way it keeps money out of um, freedom of expression on in the media in broadcast media. But on the other hand, um, there, there work there was consideration given at the time when uh, the bill was being the bill in question was being passed to the question of whether or not they could look at the amount of money capping the amount of money that a particular campaigning group could spend on its pay, on its advertising. And of course, there are problems in doing that, but nevertheless, to pass such a broad brush measure, which obviously was passed, and that was the subject matter in the case, 
I would say that the court could have made a greater effort to consider whether the measure really was proportionate to the aim pursued. And I think there was an argument for saying there was a breach of Article 10 and the measure could have been more specifically tailored um, to avoid the dominance of broadcast media by powerful groups by, as I've already said, one possibility would be capping the amount of money any one specific campaigning group could spend on um, its, its political advertising. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Uh, Christophe? Thank you so much. I would like to thank all the panelists uh, for three very insightful talks. Uh, I, I, my question, however, goes uh, to Marco. Thank you so much, Marco, for uh, uh, this uh, very illuminating presentation. Um, uh, the only uh, thing that uh, I would like to question is uh, whether or not um, uh, nowadays, as the case law stands and as the debate stands, um, the, the fact uh, opinion uh, dichotomy uh, actually still is of relevance, at least uh, as and insofar, and you indicated that coverage is concerned. You um, referred to Frederick Schauer's work on the uh, uh, distinction of uh, coverage and protection and so on and so forth. Uh, whether or not facts are actually included uh, in um, safeguards such as Article 10 ECHR uh, is a particularly German debate, uh, and even in Germany, uh, it uh, has, uh, well, uh, let's say, been ridiculed for quite some time. Back in the 90s, if I remember correctly, it was Roman Herzog who uh, made the argument that this doesn't make really sense, and it doesn't make any sense uh, as far as coverage is concerned. I'm uh, very convinced when it comes to that. Um, and so uh, I would like to question the prominence of this dichotomy, which is a false dichotomy in and by itself, because uh, if you would like to consider artistic expression of any kind, poetry, for example, uh, uh, it uh, uh, wouldn't uh, wouldn't bear uh, any uh, uh, anything uh, overall. Um, uh, uh, the um, uh, Interesting question when it comes uh, to factual statements is, of course, um, uh, whether or not their truthfulness is to be taken into account. Uh, you know, of course, that uh, in the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, there never has been, um, uh, as far as the scope of the safeguard was concerned, any distinction as to the truthfulness uh, of um, uh, the assertion in question, uh, or so at least uh, to my knowledge. Uh, so uh, uh, false statements of fact uh, have traditionally been considered uh, covered by free expression in uh, the case law of the European Court uh, of Human Rights. Uh, it was rather the question for the longest time, uh, and that's where the interesting thing comes in, um, that um, uh, whether or not that, that would hold true for uh, the US as well, uh, because um, the New York Times was Sullivan, Gertz, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, there was some dicta uh, that uh, would indicate um, uh, otherwise. Uh, however, even the US Supreme Court in the Alvarez decision, um, uh, at least the plurality of the Justices uh, has made the point uh, that um, uh, truth um, uh, is in and by itself not a necessary ingredient uh, for free uh, for speech to be considered protected. Uh, if um, uh, uh, falsity uh, comes uh, into play, the only relevant question is uh, who is. Um, uh, uh, or who may be, whose legally protected interest uh, may be violated by said falsity, something, of course, uh, the European model uh, can cope much better with uh, than the American approach, um, um, as defined in uh, the categorical approach. In uh, Czaplinski, uh, at the uh, level of uh, scope or coverage, if you will, I'd be very cautious uh, to make uh, the state uh, arbiter uh, of truth uh, from uh, the very outset. I think uh, it is uh, perhaps not the last, but one of the last uh, resorts uh, one uh, should uh, uh, seek refuge uh, when it comes uh, to uh, actually uh, finding whether or not statements of fact um, are to be considered uh, truthful or not, because um, as we are, are well aware, even though um, uh, dominant players nowadays or dominant, the playing field is shifting overall, um, the state still is not necessarily the good guy in the game that we're playing here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christoph. As we are near the, the end of this panel, maybe we can have Andrew question first. Um, after that, Marco, you can answer. Um, th thanks, Pierre. Uh, look, I wanted, I'll be quick. I want to make a, a few comments and a, and a quick question. And the question, in fact, might just be something for Helen to think about. She can respond or, or think about in, in how she develops the paper. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a question for Marco. I really enjoyed the paper and I'm really looking forward to what you develop in the second case study. Because um, I think that trying to draw links and comparisons between that history 
and the contemporary situation and how that affects free speech and democracy and how it's conceptualized is you know one of the key challenges um, we all face in much of our work so I think it's really interesting um, sorry just being interrupted with the chocolate delivery um, it's evening here uh, on Adrienne, we can talk in Melbourne because we're both there, but I just wanted to observe, um, I think I agree with you more than you think I might, um, particularly about the importance of the role of other actors and courts, I think, have a really significant role, but it's quite, it's a particular and limited role. Uh, you're not going to end up with wonderful democracy if you just have courts saying great things in, in judgment. So, but I think it's really well made points. Um, and George's question, which I loved and um, the two ideas of pluralism and democracy and how they're linked. I'd want to think about it more. My initial thought would be actually it's the first one is what the European Court of Human Rights keeps referencing. And the second one that is what's the type of interference here is one of the things it might use to get to the first one. But I think in George's mind, that may not be a great approach, but I think that's what it's doing. Um, my question now, having used up more time than I should have, um, it was just a query, Helen, when you talked about um, Manol and Centro Europa, those cases, uh, and you know it at the end, look, in some sense, what they were doing wasn't so controversial. And then you, then you do the example that's controversial, the political advertising. I wasn't quite clear what the restriction was in the first two cases, but maybe it's how it's explained or just how I've thought about it. Uh, and that's in the first two cases, a license uh, frequencies weren't allocated or things like that. There was something not done that meant there was less pluralism, um, but it, it wasn't uh, here where it's in search of pluralism, so we'll restrict somebody else's speech, which was the advertising case. So it was really just maybe to bring out that difference, if I'm right in that, um, in the different ways pluralism can get used and that sometimes it does um, lead to what Charles would call an intra-right conflict of within free speech. Um, so that might just be for you to think about. But thank you very much. Love the papers. Thank you. Mar Marco, then Helen, please. Yeah, I will answer very quickly. And thank you for the comments. I absolutely appreciate it. Uh, yes, about the, the point made by Christoph, I, I, I actually agree that the distinction between uh, statements as facts and uh, value judgments is probably uh, something quite old fashioned that uh, nowadays uh, is not supposed to, uh, you know, uh, to be to be relied on to draw distinction and 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 precise to draw a precise line between what is covered what is not and uh i i will definitely consider this point also because i think it's this idea was framed uh at least top, thinking about professional operators such as journalists for example in order to understand the degree of protection they could enjoy under certain circumstances and so i feel that uh, mostly that idea was developed with uh, a certain view, not the view that we have today uh, on, on, uh, on, on debating on whether this information can, can find constitutional protection or not, and whether we can uh, uh, implement measures. Uh, it's not a coincidence that I, I, I try to make the point that, uh, you know, we can uh, agree on the fact that this is not covered by uh, the constitution, but the real, the key point is whether states are allowed to interfere and to uh, introduce measures that are not creating, uh, of course, chilling effect. I'm, I'm not concerned with the fact that we can consider something to be disinformation. Um, we, we, if we say that this is out of the scope of constitutional protection, uh, that should not be a problem per se. But the point is whether the state, when implementing measures in order to uh, prevent or in a way to uh, make, make get rid of this information is actually uh, undermining the right of the speakers, maybe with chilling effects, maybe with some collateral censorship that may result maybe uh, from, from certain measures. I'm thinking about the German law, the Nestle, uh, making some pressures and creating some pressures for removal and for over blocking, if possible, over blocking effect on, on social networks. So, I, I, I have personally that, that view. I, I, 
uh, I think it, it makes sense only only to that to that extent. But I I I I, I agree on the fact that we should not rely on this difference. Also, because I think it's it's quite difficult to draw a precise line. I think the the court. Uh, it seems to me that the court, the European Court of Human Rights, tried to resort on this point just to, uh, uh, in, a, in a protective uh, sense, just by making the point that requiring to prove truthfulness uh, of certain value judgment will be an impermissible, an impermissible burden on, the, on an impermissible restriction will create some risk. So, I, I will resort. Only on, and to that extent on this distinction, even if I had totally agree in the fact that it is actually very, very difficult and uh, uh, most notably uh, a point that I miss in my presentation, but I, 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 I just want to recall is that, of course, we are in a very difficult domain since there is a very strict interference with the use of this information in the context of electoral propaganda and uh, political speech. So uh, all the more, I, I, I feel that it's, it's uh, very, very difficult to draw any line in this respect and to expect that drawing the line you are uh, claiming normative consequence or specific normative choices. And I also agree on the fact that it's, it's, it's very um, challenging to think that the state should be the arbiter in a way. Uh, I, I'm, I know that uh, courts are reluctant in uh, certain circumstances to uh, take you know, the job of rewriting history, as they said, in some circumstances, the court itself, the European court itself, uh, used this wording in, uh, in certain cases. And I think that's, that's the same problem we have when, when, when we enter into the merits of certain uh, issues such as hate speech and denial of certain uh, historical events. Um, and actually, I, I, I think that this measure should not be encouraged. Of course, I, I I'm trying to make the point that uh, I uh, wonder if these policies and these measures implemented by states may safeguard democracy, but at the same time are not undermining free speech of the right of the speakers, uh, because I don't think that we should implement uh, strong measures. Um, in, in in that respect, otherwise the risk is that we create very strong chilling effects, most notably because of the structure of the public sphere, where we leave this job to private platforms that may have an economic interest to pursue, and may be less sensitive to uh, the protection of maybe of the right of the speaker. That's my so, thank you very much for this comments and also to. Thank you, Marco. Ellen. Okay, on yeah, Andrew's question. So, yes, I would say it was um, a kind of intra right conflict. Um, the restriction did relate to allocation of frequencies. So, for example, in the Italian case, um, the um, broadcasting company in question had tried to get a frequency allocated to it for a period of time. Eventually, it did get a frequency allocated to it, but it was limited. So, therefore, it couldn't reach as many people in as many areas of Italy as it was seeking to reach. And that was why it brought the case. And obviously, uh, the court, as you, as you found, found that Italy had failed in its positive obligation to put in place a framework in relation to allocation of frequencies that would allow, but well, would tend to break the idea of a media monopoly of the more the more powerful broadcasting station, um, which was obviously commanding, had a greater reach due to the particular frequency that it had already been allocated. Thank you very much, Ellen. So we have come to the end of this panel, and um, as we have quite a long afternoon, I will stop our conversation here. Uh, and also, I assume that much of this conversation will continue at least through our first panel. So thank you very much, all, especially Ellen, Marco, and Adrienne, for their very great presentation and generous answer to questions and comments. Um, our next panel starts in 55 minutes, so at 1 p.m. French time. Um, see you then and uh, have a good lunch for for people who lunch and have a nice sleep if you if you go to sleep. Thank you so much. <laughs>